progress is something driven by those things may lead to the development of markets far from the bank accounts. That progress has, as we watch the progress of the modern world, progress has always required the evolution of new public goods. Uh, if you had to come up with a hat to represent the 18th century, <coughs> and the 18th century saw the development of central banking, there's two public sanitation, public service, that is the idea of a public service chosen on merit, and there's the idea. That was an idea chosen because it was stolen from the Chinese who've been doing it based on exams for about a thousand years. In the UK, in Port and Commission, they tried to make money from it. That's, the public. That's roughly how they ran the public service until 1854. There is a There's the central bank note. I can give you a long lecture about central bank notes. I can give you a very short lecture about central bank notes. This is a promise between me and the Australian Central Bank. I give it to Pia, and it's now a promise from the central bank to Pia. We can't do that. We can't do that online. It has to go through a private issuer of money, um, a private bank. Isn't that a remarkable? Um, sorry, that shouldn't be the point. Um, so, uh, the, the question of public goods goes back to the beginning of humanity. Now, probably this doesn't go back to the beginning of humanity, but you get the idea. Our first technologies were social capital, uh, the, the, which is now allowing us all to sit in this room with a, a full understanding of what's going our role in the process is, language itself, and it was only then that uh, markets came into existence and there was an economist who wrote about all this stuff, and that was his name, Adam Smith, his first book was called The Theory of Moral Sentiments, about capitalism and social capital, uh, he then wrote a book called The Wealth of Nations, about uh, the importance of markets, and had uh, previously written a treatise on that economists don't have quite such a broad um, vision these days. Anyway, what am I going to use for a hat for the 21st century? Obviously, that's a very important question. And I'm not sure that that really does it. So that's really all I can come up with. Um, but we now are creating all these new public goods, open source software, the language instincts rendered into executive code stuff that we write and it'll do stuff for us for the rest of time. An incredible thing. All the platforms, some built for profit, some built philanthropically, are the public goods of the 21st century. So in fact, the way I think you should think about public goods is over on one side we've got the public goods that economists have referred to as a problem. Uh, they're public goods that won't build themselves, like a lighthouse. Why won't the lighthouse build itself? Because once the light's on, any ship take advantage of the lighthouse, whether it pays its dues or not. And then over here we have emerging public goods which just build themselves, and then uh, public goods that are built on platforms. And we have discovered another public good, uh, which is open data. And um, I think, I'm, I, you, you, many of you will know that I was involved in the Government 2.0 Task Force. That was back in the days when Australia was clearly one of the three leaders in the world. Um, and um, I think we've stalled. We haven't just stalled in terms of making progress on that vision in 2009, but we've also stalled in that I think as a 
a lot more to the whole idea of open data and getting data to work for us uh, than simply this idea of this obvious idea, this no-brainer that governments have generated a whole lot of data and so it wouldn't be useful to use that data as a community resource. Uh, so the, on the one side of this equation, we have data activists, business to some extent, and civil society saying we want more data access to government data. And on the other side, we have inertia, bureaucratic, intellectual, and political. And we, it's a real pity, I think, that our economists that, who, who, who kind of rule the roost, who are regarded as the, uh, the custodians of the most important parts of the government policy in many ways, haven't really cottoned on to this. Yes, they're kind of in favour of it, but they don't think it's that important. Uh, I think it's, and, and yet, uh, somebody like uh, Frederick Hayek wrote that, uh, it, that, that information is in fact completely central to the function of economies. And uh, that's not a fancy intellectual point, it's a point that if you need the dollars and cents, there are plenty of dollars and cents there. Uh, this is the McKinsey Institute, which made a whole bunch of heroic assumptions, but nevertheless, I think those kinds of heroic assumptions are worth making to get an indicative idea, an indicative uh, of the magnitude of the thing, of the things we're talking about. They come come to the conclusion that more open data can generate between 3.2 and 5.4 trillion dollars for the world economy. We uh, lateral economics did a case study, did a bunch of case studies. Uh, Context of the G20 summit in uh, Brisbane, uh, funded by Amelia Network, and we sort of began thinking that that was a um, that that was a uh, likely to be an overestimate, and we ended up thinking it probably is conservative, and we ended up with a fairly similar number through a different process. We looked at a whole lot of um, we looked at a whole lot of um, case studies, I'll just take you through one, which is macroeconomic data. Um, we don't take it, we don't, it's, it's amazing that the managers of our macro economy don't have as good access as they, as, as they should have to BAS data on activity exports, CapEx, PAYE data. Uh, we are now open sourcing, or I think the Treasury is, is open sourcing the, the models that it uses, and obviously sensitive do, uh, as the Treasury and the, um, uh, the US Fed have done, and also we should be using real-time uh, private data, so more and more uh, accounting is being done in the cloud, and I don't know whether we've gone enough mile in the euro for the, some aggregated data that they have, but we should. Uh, and if those things could bring about a 5% and a 7.5% improvement quality of our macroeconomic um, uh, management, then that could produce outsized benefits in our avoidance of uh, cyclical co costs in the, in the way the economy cycles. And we uh, guess that to be about $3.6 billion per year. Um, here's another, just another example. We have a lot of public sector information about what, what employees think of workplaces. It's all in the state of the service report, but of course it's published in a way that's prone to upset any sound chaps who run the departments. Uh, and in the United States, where it is published, first <coughs> which agency came bottom or second bottom just before Hurricane Katrina. You, you guessed it, FEMA. Uh, the, uh, I don't want to single out the APSC for just this problem with the APSC, as I want to single out the APSC for some other things that it does. Um, the uh, APSC publishes a lot of data about uh, um, the careers of public servants, and um, Felix Barber. 
Marblehead has turned that into a business and uh, I don't know whether you'll be able to hear this video but it's a one minute video which explains what this website will do with APS Jobs Data. This is all based on the APS Jobs uh, site, and the data is presented in PDF files and Word files, and the, and the performance changes every few months. And when I last knew about this, Felix had given up running that service. Um, so much for the value of data that we spend lots of money collecting. Uh, this is the APS site. This is the equivalent uh, Gazette in the UK, where they take these things more seriously and have done for some time. The UK, where uh, which has had prime ministers who are in favour of this sort of stuff for about 15 years, who have never had a prime minister who is in favour of this sort of stuff. Um, and as you can see in the UK Gazette, it doesn't just give you the data; it asks you. You know, would you like prize with that? Do you want a CSV, Excel, PDF, Excel, or whatever you like? Um, so these are the case studies that we produced, and we that we thought that the, the public sector data agenda was worth about sixteen billion dollars a year to the economy. Um, this is a spider graph which shows you that Australia is now well we well below the performance of the two leaders. US and the UK. I don't think that was true in 2009. None of us were doing much, but in terms of IT development, we were right there and very well respected around the world. But I actually want to go beyond government data uh, because that's what I think the where we're showing a kind of lack of imagination. Because we can have a big impact on how open a whole lot of other data is, and nobody really is talking about that much. We could have been talking. This. I have been talking about this for about 20 years, uh, but I want to give you some, some examples. And essentially, what I call this government as impresario, doesn't even have, some of it doesn't even have to be done by government, but it's about convening power. It's about saying, let's get, get together and try and get a standard going and get stuff happening. So, the old one of the, an obvious example is personal information management services. That is why when you go to a chain of bank, you have to turn up with your passport and all the rest of the ID, and when you change telecommunications provider and all that sort of stuff, why can't you simply tick a box and your data moves? Where it's absolutely clear that the world is going to look something like that in 15 years' time, but you will be custodian of your data and people will come to you and ask for access to that data. Banks, data custodians, people who want to see you guides to the arts and sports or, or whatever. Are we trying to rush there? Well, no, we're not. The United Kingdom is. And one way of thinking about this is that that was the technology stack circa a couple of hundred years ago. Uh, and that's and the technology the technology stack is a fantastic it occurred to me to go down on the run. Um, it would have worn my better eyes would occur to me. The the term technology stack such an idea, which is that we're just stacking one thing on another, and after a whole bunch of fiddling around, they just run together. They just run forever. Uh, and then we stack something else on. This is an incredible thing that we, we're doing now. And on the back
back of the technology stack, we can create these vortexes into which data goes and we get out something that makes sense. Um, we get the platform. The platform is public goods. In the UK, they're working on personal information management services. Have been for about four or five years. They've put through legislation to give people, uh, it hasn't been proclaimed yet, but the legislation gives people control of their data and the ability to demand their data from people who have it, service providers who have it from them, and they have got a large partnership of large public and private institutions working on standards and so on. They're not getting anywhere terribly fast, so we can do this stuff too. And then there's TripAdvisor and Yelp and uh, Pandora and Ginny, which is Pandora for films. We should be having these kinds of things for those those sorts of services. I'll be crying about that for about two years too. And it's getting easier and easier to do it. We can even do it for workplaces. So. We, we, we have lots of debates in Australia about what the idea that workplaces should be more flexible and be, should be easier to sack people and hire people and so on. Maybe it should be, maybe it shouldn't be. But isn't it remarkable that we have that debate about freedom of movement in and out of work, workplaces and flexibility without focusing on my experience, which is that you can't make much of a choice if you don't know what workplaces are like largely the position of an employee trying to figure out whether they want to work for one worker or another. And yet, firms have that data. Most firms have, large firms have all that data. They survey their workers all the time. Wouldn't it be nice to see that data? Ah, but I can cry. If we force that data out, then all sorts of, all sorts of diverse consequences might arise and they might well. But why don't best firms. Why don't the best firms release that data? I think the reason is because there's no standard to report against. And therefore, there's no point in releasing the data because their competitors who actually perform worse can release other data which makes them look just as good. So what's the point? So the idea of Windows on Workplaces, which I took to the 2020 summit, was to get a standard going and start using the convening power of government or anyone you like, the head of the ACTU, the head of the business council, to start challenging things to start doing this stuff. Essentially nothing to lose and uh, a great deal to gain. So here's our map. And one other point I want to make is that uh, we've got data here and there's another point, which is that um, on this side, yeah, on that side are all the things that will fund themselves or have been funded, for instance, by government. And on that side, uh, and, and, and on that side, there are things that are fun, that we have to fund by government to build those public goods. There are a whole lot of other possible things which private entrepreneurs might be able to build a fantastic version of but they can't make enough money out of advertising to really make it work. Think of Google. Google could be marketed as a private good on a subscription basis. It works so much more as a public good that they give it away because they can make more out of the 6% of the value it generates as a public good than they could out of 100% of the private value that it generates as a subscription model. What are other things that look like that? Oh, sorry about that. Here I was in San Francisco in 2002, I was, sorry, 2012, and I was looking for my killer example for this, and I think this is a classic case. 23andMe for $99 sells you a powerful genomic sequence, sequencing. And, and they've got, they're getting up to about a million customers. Um, imagine how much more powerful that would be as a public and what you would do is Medicare would bulk bill it. It would be free. When you went to the doctor, the doctor would say, if you want to do this, you don't want to do it. It creeps you out in some way. You don't want the government knowing that 
with James, you don't have to do it. If we would be able to get team with these people pretty quickly, I would think. And so just little old Australia has a database 10 times the global leader because it's built as a public good. Medicare gets the data. Medicare can use the data to better target screening. We get an incredible research as best asset because the way we set it up, we can make sure that that data in its anonymized form is open and available for research. It can be used to find individuals, it can be used to improve diagnosis. That's not worth $99 capital value for each person I'd like to know what it is. Um, just by the way, this on my on the back of my envelope, this uh, if you're looking to replicate associations of genetic of phenotypes and genotypes or characteristics with gen genomic structures, the, this does it about ten times ten thousand percent more efficiently than we do typically in emergency in, in control studies. There are lots of other public private partnerships that we can do. This is Murma, a Melbourne startup that does uh, employee engagement, that provides employee engagement software for a fee. The government could say to start negotiating with, with Murma or things like it. How much, what lump sum would you like from us to make this free to everyone in, uh, to, to all small businesses in our jurisdiction, whether it's Victoria or Australia? That's efficient pricing because the price is the margin of cost, so it's justified on that basis alone, but it's, it's much more valuable and that's the venue generator standard. The standard is this thing, and you can then help introduce firms with all the appropriate permissions from different industries which seem to be able to solve different problems with their employees and so on. There are all sorts of ways in which that would generate benefits. We can do something similar with accounting, and I won't uh, uh, go any further on that because there are all sorts of interesting things we can do there. Sense T is an interesting public private partnership on agricultural sensors in, the, in, in Tasmania. It's run by a university which so they've recently um, rearranged the thing in various dysfunctional ways, uh, but it's still a great idea. Uh, and so there and there are so in conclusion there are any number of the, the repertoire of government as impresario is every bit as um, varied as the repertoire for monetizing sites um, in the private sector. Uh, are we thinking about this stuff much? Well, not much. Uh, but that's what I think we should be thinking about. So um, 